I am Dr. John Newfeld. You're watching Back to the Bible Canada. Thanks for joining me today. I'm completing a series on uh, the life of David, not his entire life, but simply that very short beginning of the story when David goes from being a shepherd boy uh, to being a mighty warrior who's recognized all throughout Israel. Uh, in this series, what I've tried to do is, is a number of things. I, I've limited the scope of the story, but I'm trying to make a point, and that is there is something for us to learn from the life of David. And, the, and, and what we learn is that we can live with purpose. And David's life does teach us that. Now, I've noticed several things. In fact, let me no, uh, suggest four things that we can take from this series already. Number one, God chose David to become king. He didn't rise to become king because of his own aspirations. And I've made a point from that. Don't look to become someone great. Um, rather, entrust your life and your future into the hands of God. So that's the first thing. David didn't rise to become this because of his own aspirations. Rather, God chose him for this. Uh, number two, uh, David didn't choose the time in which he lived nor did he choose how his calling would be worked out. In other words, the, the time in which he lived dictated the kind of life that he would have. So it does no good to bemoan the fact that if only I had lived at another time or in a different circumstance, things would have worked out better. Uh, don't allow yourself to go there. Rather, accept what God has in his meticulous sovereignty given you. Number three, um, uh, you know, from what we've learned, uh, from David, we can content ourselves to allow God to direct us in the way that he chooses. Um, so, you know, uh, allow God to direct you. That is, become a man or a woman after the heart of God, and then find the will of God, your delight, and then be directed by him. Say with with great joy, I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. You know, say that, and uh, it will go well with you. Uh, and then finally, we notice how God has been preparing David for the role that he had, and that at least for the 15 year, first 15 years of his life, and I know that seems like a short period of time, but nonetheless, he labored on in obscurity. Uh, he was a shepherd boy in the back pasture. Uh, that's who he was, and he learned to be faithful in the task that God has given him. You know, wherever you are, whether that task seems like a minor matter or a large matter, don't let that trouble you. Ask rather, Lord, teach me to be faithful. That, you know, Jesus says that the one who is faithful in little things will be handed uh, many things, but the one who's, you know, unfaithful in little things will be handed nothing. So, you know, that's what we should, should remember. Okay, um, let's not despise whatever role that God has given us. Let's rather find joy in it. Let's be faithful. So we're saying don't ask great things of yourself. Ask rather, Lord, direct me in your purposes. Okay, then as we come to David and Goliath, David for the first 15 years has labored in relative obscurity. He's the youngest of eight sons. Um, and now suddenly he's launched onto the public stage. And I use the word suddenly um, with, a, with a great deal of emphasis because that's what it was. I mean, he's going to the battlefield not to fight, but to bring food for the troops. He's been sent by his father through a series of events. He now is in that dry, wadi riverbed, and he's facing off against Goliath, who is a man killer. And David kills him very quickly. And suddenly he goes from obscurity. I mean, it comes on him suddenly, not slowly, not gradually, not bit by bit so that he has time to adjust to the transition. No, no, it happens all at once, bang, suddenly he is very famous. He's on the public stage. And in fact, his life of obscurity is over. And from this day on, people are singing songs about him. In fact, one of the songs they sang was, Saul, that is the king, has struck down his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. Now, Saul had every reason in the world to mistrust David after that, uh, because he said like, wow, what else can they, you know, what else can they praise him for? I mean, you know, it looks like he's more popular than I am. And so, you know, Saul eventually is going to become his enemies. But David had hit the big times very, very quickly. And um, everyone now notices him. People are handing him accolades. He could hardly go anywhere where people are praising him for saving Israel from their enemies. Now, Let's take a, a look back and think about what's just happened to David. 
You know, more than one person has been utterly ruined because of stardom. You know, sudden fame rather than gradual recognition where you have a chance to acclimatize, that's happened to more than one individual. And in fact, one author commenting on this said these words, and I, and I quote here, fame is a seductress. It draws us in with one tempting thought, the allure of more. Now think about that, the allure of more. Thousands of screaming fans, man, I could have more. The thrill of an audience, it hangs on to every word, I could have more. And then this author said, it hits us right where we're weakest, right where so many of us fall, where evil itself originates. Where's that? Our pride. Yeah, it plays upon pride, and suddenly your pride becomes a monster. I mean, up to that point in time, you may have been struggling with pride, but not like this. Suddenly a monster is upon us. And now the author goes on to say, why are there so many Hollywood divorces? Why are there so many music stars in rehab? Why are mega pastors prone to moral failure? And the answer has a lot to do with the fact that they begin to breathe in what people are saying. I mean, I once had, you know, uh, somebody say, um, you know, if, if, if everyone's praising you, think of it like perfume, uh, you know, take a sniff every once in a while, but don't drink it, don't ingest it, don't internalize it. Well, that's easier said than done. Because after a while, that perfume so- uh, smells really sweet, and you're going to want another whiff, and another one, and another one, and pretty well, you're intoxicated by the perfume of your own fame. And with that, this author asks his own question, or answers his own question. I mean, the question is, why are so many, you know, rock stars, you know, in rehab and all that other stuff? He says, once it hooks you with its seductive claws and addicts you with its compulsive nature, fame begins to sink its teeth into you. Slowly it takes over until you're no longer yourself. You're only your public persona. That's the only you that you know is the people that you see uh, reflecting an image back from the adoring crowds. That's who you, in fact, become. And David is about to discover uh, the life of what many people simply dream about. People would be singing about David. He would become a household name. Uh, The question is then to be asked, what is now to become of David at this point in time? And it's right here where I think David's life has a great deal to teach us. Surprisingly, what keeps David sane in all of this, you know, where others have fallen, but David doesn't seem to, is that God providentially brings something into David's life. And that keeps his feet planted on the ground. And you say, well, what is that something? And my answer is it's actually not a something, it's a someone. God brings Jonathan, who becomes his faithful friend, into his life. Now, who's Jonathan? Well, Jonathan is the son of the king. He is heir to the throne. Jonathan grew up with royalty in his blood. Jonathan knew what fame was all about. And Jonathan immediately comes close to him. So let's read 1 Samuel 17, 55 to 58. Here we read, As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth. And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now, Uh, You know, okay, I'm already make the point. At this point in time, David's life is never going to be the same. He is brought by Abner, who is the, you know, the four-star general, the five-star general, how many stars they have, I can't remember. But, you know, he's the, the leader, the commander of all the troops. So he answers directly to the king. And Abner notices him and says, I'm going to take him directly to the king. So, I mean, suddenly his status rises. Now, there are some critics of the Bible who say, you know, this just couldn't have happened that way. Because on the one hand, the previous chapter, in chapter 16, we learned that um, Saul's servants have a problem with Saul because, you know, madness is overtaking him and evil spirit is molesting him. And he goes into these fits of rage and, you know, his rage is just bubbling out and they're, they're looking for someone to play the harp to calm the king's soul down. And, and they find David. 
And uh, they introduced David to him and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, wasn't David introduced to the king before? And now he's being introduced all over again as if the king doesn't know him. You know, there are a lot of critics that say, well, you know, these are two separate conflicting accounts. And I mean, we can't make these things fit together. But, you know, if, if you think that, I, I think that's just wrong. And I'll give you a reason why. According to the account of the Bible, Saul is meeting, King Saul is meeting people all the time all the time. I mean, he's constantly meeting with the elders of Israel. He's meeting with key military leaders. He's meeting with other politicians who are responsible for the various cities throughout Israel. Uh, he has his spies that are reporting back to him. And on top of that, according to the text, he's constantly recruiting the best fighting men in the country. He is on the look and he's meeting people every single day. In other words, he's shaking hands with strangers every single day. And if you did that, and if you met new people every single day, it's quite not only possible, but probable that you're going to be introduced to somebody you've met before and you have absolutely no memory of him. I, you know, who is a musician in King Saul's court? That's not a notable person. He's not a general. He's not a, you know, he's not a fighting man. He's not any of those things. This is simply somebody who sits in the corner and lets his heart playing fill the room. So Saul's not asking who he was. He was introduced to him once, and, uh, you know, that's already out of mind. But now, this young man who he didn't even notice was playing in the corner of the room uh, has taken the courage to fight against the Philistine champion, and now Saul will never forget who he is. Now he's going to know. And then with David's stunning victory, something happens. Not only has he got the bloody head of, you know, the, the, the Philistine in his hand, Goliath, but he's also um, being asked, what family are you from? So suddenly, David's entire family is immediately elevated. Everyone knows about that family and the most famous offspring they produced. His entire life is now changed. So I, I think there's a lesson to be learned here. Uh, this lesson is simple. Fame changes, not some. Fame changes everyone, everyone, everyone. Every once in a while, we hear people say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be the same person I always was when I got famous. Or we hear people who did get famous and say, I'm still the same person I always was. And my answer to that is simple. No, you're not. Uh, in fact, it's sheer blindness about yourself. In fact, when everyone speaks well of you, it's going to affect you. You're not going to be the same person. Whenever you enter a room, when all heads turn towards you because you're the person in the room that everybody notices, you're not going to be the same person. You've got to learn how to handle that. It's true. But one thing has absolutely certain. Fame changes every single person who ever gets it. You might want to think about that if you really have a heart's desire to become famous, because it will not only change you in most people, it will subvert you. So let's con continue to read. I'm reading now 1 Samuel 18, 1 to 4. As soon as he, that is David, had finished speaking to Saul, the passage says, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, uh, you know, David's launched into fame. We get that. But immediately Jonathan notices. And the first thing that Jonathan does is um, he says, oh, look, I, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to watch his back. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give him the best military equipment that I have. Now, the question is, is now Jonathan bereft of an armor himself? And, you know, our text doesn't actually tell us whether or not he is. I suspect if he was, he would have been capable of getting another armor set. Nonetheless, Jonathan's immediate action tells me that he says to David, not only are you going to be my friend, but I'm going to be watching your back. I'm going to make sure that your military equipment is as good as it can get so that you'll be as safe as is possible given these days. Now, I also want you to notice that twice in the text that I've just read, it says that Jonathan loved David. Yeah, it says he loved him, loved him as his own soul. So it's time to, you know, it's 
clear the table here for a moment and talk about something that has been said. Now, the first time I heard this, I was a student in university at the U of S in Saskatoon, and I had a prof who was making the case in a sociology class for homosexuality. And he said that one of the most famous homosexuality um, stories that we know come from the Bible, and it's David and Jonathan. And he read these very passages, didn't know the guy actually knew anything about the Bible. And then um, also we have another statement in 2 Samuel, where it again reiterates the kind of love that Jonathan had for David. And he said, even today, uh, David says to Jonathan, your love was sweeter to me than the love of women. So that's what David himself says to Jonathan. And so this becomes proof positive in many people's eyes that there was actually a homosexual relationship going on here. Now, um, I've looked at that a lot, and uh, the more I hear it, the sadder I become. I think it's a tragedy that this continues to be repeated, and let me tell you why. Uh, first of all, we now live in a culture, that is the one that I live in, and most likely you do as well, um, where our culture, Western culture, sexualizes almost everybody and everything. There are now all sorts of schools throughout the Western world where children are being taught that they need to discover their sexual preferences already in the very first grade. So they don't even get to pass through the time of innocence long before they even understand what sex is all about, and they shouldn't know. Let me say this. They shouldn't know. They should be allowed the innocence of childhood, the innocence of being a little boy or being a little girl and, and enjoying life to the fullest. Instead, they're already being um, discipled and shaped uh, for a overly hyped up, sexualized culture in which uh, pornography and sexual relationships and, uh, you know, people of power falling constantly because of sexual misdeeds, that's going to be introduced to them before they've even hardly got a chance to breathe. We have become sexualized so that it's oozing out of every pore of our bodies so that when we hear that Saul, I mean, sorry, Jonathan and David loved one another, that in our worldview, we can't even imagine that it's anything other than uh, that. So let me tell you a little story. Uh, years ago, um, and it's a number of years ago now, um, but we had a pastor staying at our house. He was going to a conference in our area, and he had flown in from Rwanda. He was a black man, and uh, we were delighted to put him up, and uh, he and I got to know one another. Uh, as uh, in this one-week period of time, I don't know how quickly, but our friendship just seemed to, I've hardly ever met a person that I so much just liked. I would say I loved him. Uh, and in fact, uh, the stories that he told me of how he had himself, by the providence of God, managed to escape the, the, uh, the, the atrocities that had happened in Rwanda at one point in time, even lying before a ditch to be beheaded, and God had intervened. I mean, it was amazing the stories he told, and uh, we just spent our evenings talking with one another. And we prayed with each other, and uh, we sought the Lord together, and I knew the time of our you know, our short time together was coming to an end. And as it came to an end, uh, on the day that he was to go to the airport, uh, my wife said to me, listen, can both of you just stand in front of the garage? I just need to take a picture of you two men together. And we were delighted to do that. And as we stood there together, he reached over to hold my hand. And I just froze. <laughs> and he immediately withdrew his hand. And I knew in an instant what had happened, and he did as well. See, the culture that he comes from, it is common for men, it's not sexualized at all, to walk down the streets hand in hand. It's a sign of friendship, not of sexuality. But in North American culture, it's a sign of something entirely different, and he recognized it. I could see he was embarrassed, and I was embarrassed, and somehow we needed to you know, just talk about that because there were two cultures in collision, and we saw the world so differently, and that needed to be understood. See, after that incident, however, I've thought about it since, and I felt sadness. I feel sadness that we live in a culture that's forgotten that men can actually confess love for one another that's not sexualized at all. I mean, the idea of a deep love between two men uh, in our world can't, isn't even feasible without raging hormones. And it tells me that there's something deeply depraved 
about the kind of culture that we have created so that all sorts of cultures throughout the world shake their heads and say, what in the world has happened to you? And the reason I'm mentioning this is because you have to understand that people who make the charge that these two men were in a homosexual relationship do that because they live in this oversexed culture in which sex has to be at the center of everything. Deep love for one another can't be expressed in any other way outside of, excuse me for being crass, but pulling our pants down. I mean, there's something deeply um, disturbing about the culture that that we live in. And I I pray for our children. I pray for all sorts of things because of that. But I I mention all of this because let me add something to this thought. Uh, In their book, The Lonely American, Authors Jacqueline Olds and Richard Schwartz, both of them are medical doctors, and they wrote this book um, at the beginning of the millennium. And uh, they pointed out at the beginning of the millennium that at that time, 25% of American households consisted of only one person, 25, one quarter. Now, that number has risen dramatically since. But at the printing of that book, that was the number then. And they pointed out that the contrast was between 1940, that number was only at 7%. So there is a growing loneliness among people. That's what they pointed out. And and here's what they said. This affects our physical and emotional health. When it comes to some of the greatest physical and psychological needs people have, they say the elephant in the room is loneliness. The elephant in the room is the, the absence of deep, rich, abiding, lifelong friendships. That's what's missing so that, especially among men, also among women, but more so among men, there is among men a phenomenon today which has now been well discussed. It's called the friendless North American male. Uh, Men after men, uh, man after man after man will say, I have not one person in the entire world that I would call a friend. That I could just simply pick up the phone and just spend some time chatting because I want to. See, that's the interesting thing about that. So let's look at the kind of relationship that David and Jonathan shared with one another. Now, the first thing that we notice in the text is that, you know, the relationship began right there when David had defeated Goliath. And so we might ask, so why did it begin then? Well, the answer has to do with going all the way back to 1 Samuel 14. In 1 Samuel 14, there is the Battle of Michmash. And Israel was hiding from the Philistines because the the, the Jews, as I've said before, didn't have armor as many of the Philistines did, but also they didn't have proper weapons of warfare and they were intimidated. They're hiding in rocks in the ground. And Jonathan steps to the fore and he stands on a small piece of ground and he kills 20 men, and all of Israel rallies around him, and they rout um, the, uh, the, the Philistines on that occasion. Now, you might say, well, why didn't Jonathan do it again when Goliath stood in the breach? And I have no doubt in the world that the answer is that his father, the king, said, listen, son, you are heir to the throne. You ain't going to do that. Somebody else is. But when David stood in there, Jonathan recognized in David a man that was like himself. And when I say like himself, what do I mean? I think at least three characteristics. One, he had faith. David believed that God would deliver him from Goliath's hand. That's the kind of faith that Jonathan had as well. Secondly, uh, David had courage to stand in the day of battle. He didn't just have faith. He was going to get off his duff and do something about it. He was going to act on his faith, and that required courage. Jonathan recognized that in David. The third thing that I think the two of them had together is they had a passionate, passionate zeal for their God. In other words, these men at the very outset had a friendship that was based on a common passion. They, both of them, had something in their lives that was greater than themselves. And when they saw the same in another, it was just a natural for the two men to lock arms with each other and say, Let's pursue this passion together. Let's do it side by side. You know, it's sometimes said that men who serve in in war have that kind of deep friendship with one another, and I think that's true. But I think it also happens to any two Christian men who will have a passion for something. 
I know of Christian men who together had a passion for refugees and they built a refugee house and they did it with one with another and it, it, it just enriched a friendship because they had the same calling on their lives. Let me say something about that. You see, to have a calling and recognize that same calling in someone else is the beginning of not just friendship but partnership. It's the two things combined together. See, the great lack in our day is that, you know, lonely people are reaching out out of desperation. And look, I, you know, if that's you, I mean, I've got nothing but compassion for you. And I, I you know, my, my prayer for you is that God would give you something that he created you for, friendship. But I want to say something that the deepest, richest friendships, the ones that are enduring and the ones that are lasting, are the ones that believe that there's something greater than themselves. And if that something is that God and the mission that he has given us in our lives is greater than ourselves. Now listen to me. That's the beginning of the ideal of friendship. That's what partnership actually looks like. Well, now, so, so you know, um, but it's on this matter. <laughs> it's on this matter that a lot of Bible teachers have wondered, especially about Jonathan. Shouldn't he have known, is the question, that a friendship with David would hurt him? And so let's talk about that for a moment. You see, in 1 Samuel chapter 20, when Saul is attempting to kill David, this is later after this event, Jonathan acts to protect his friend from his father. And Saul tells his son, as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. That's what he says. See, so you've got to understand this. You make this guy a friend. He is an impediment to you, and he's going to take you down. That's what Saul says. And in many ways, that makes sense. So let me take you far back, all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 13. You remember, this is before the Battle of Michmash began. And Saul had been offering up unlawful sacrifices to God. And uh, they're unlawful because Saul is of the tribe of Benjamin. Only the tribe of Levi may offer sacrifices. Saul ignores the stipulation, the regulations of God, says, I'm king, I can make my own laws. Why do I need to worry about God? Samuel the prophet shows up for Samuel 13, 13 and 14. And Samuel said to Saul, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God which he commanded you, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, and now your kingdom shall not continue. Now, the the men around Saul would have heard those words from Samuel as well. No doubt, Jonathan, who is in line to the throne, would have heard that as well. And then later in 1 Samuel 15, a similar event where Samuel again says that, you know, says to Saul, God has rejected you from being king. And here's one more factor. I'm taking you to 1 Samuel 24 here. And in verse 20, uh, Saul himself admits to David. He knows that David will become king. And we also find Jonathan at one point in time saying to David, I know that you will be king. And he says to Jonathan, I will be supporting you. That's a fascinating thing. So Jonathan, who in fact would have been older than David, Jonathan, who is in fact the son of the king, Jonathan, who you would have thought would be in line for the throne, recognizes that God is doing something in David's life, and he decides to step back. Now, this is a very interesting thing to do, and allow David to take the lead, and he says to David, I'll be watching your back all the way through. It's a fascinating thing. So again, we're left with this. Is Jonathan committing himself to David at his own expense? Well, let me fast forward you to somebody who's greater than David, and that's Jesus, who is the son of David and who ultimately inherits David's throne. There is somebody that was very much like Jonathan was, and this man's name was John the Baptist. Initially in John's ministry, there were thousands and thousands of people showing up at his revival meetings, and they were getting increasingly larger until Jesus showed up. And when Jesus showed up, John started saying, look, there's the Lamb of God. He, you know, he takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people are looking at John the Baptist and they're following after Jesus. And John sees his crowds getting smaller and smaller. And that's a hard lump for anyone to take. And so when John is asked about that, he says of Jesus, I must decrease, he says, but he must increase. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like in this case, 
This is what Jonathan recognized as well. You know, they say the hardest instrument to play in an orchestra is second violin. It is to be the backup to the person who gets all the accolades. But it is a role that God recognized, that, sorry, that Jonathan recognized that God wanted him to play. So this is why David's fame didn't destroy him, because he was the friend of a man who stood by him, who taught him what fame actually looked like, and taught him what it meant to put his own desires aside and serve God rather than serve himself. Jonathan modeled that every single day for David, and David learned. So what do I take from all of this? I think the lesson for us from all of this today is simply this. You can't fight alone. You can't fight alone. God has so designed the Christian life that none of us should live alone. I mean, one of the reasons for church is not just that we have an opportunity with others to worship God together. I mean, that's huge. But it's also that we would find people who have a similar mission to ourselves. And then together with them, give ourselves to something greater, to the glory of God. And it's out of that kind of, a, of, a, of an environment that comes these rich, meaningful friendships that take us all the way through life so that when we encounter each other once again in glory, we'll fall into each other's arms and say, friend, I'm so glad you're here. You see, the important thing is this. If we're going to live lives of significance, embrace the role that God has for you. If you are to take the lead, take it humbly and learn from those who are supporting you in leadership and recognize who they are and say, Lord, make me like them. And if you're in a supportive role, embrace that role as well. See, our passage ends well. 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul sent him over the men of, uh, set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of the servants of Saul. See, initially, it was working well. And if Saul would have been a godly man, David's friendship with his son would have served the kingdom well. It was sin that really brought disruption into that. But that's the lesson for all of us. Serve the Lord with gladness. Don't serve him alone. Hey, thanks for being with me today. God bless you on this day. May the Lord give you grace to put into practice some of the things that you've been learning. Be blessed. May the Lord our God be with you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.